Good afternoon, as it is here in Beaufort, South Carolina, on this uh, beautiful afternoon of Monday, April 13th, the day after Easter. I am going to talk to you a little bit today about Reconstruction and the pivotal year of 1866. This program is brought to you by the University of South Carolina, Beaufort, in conjunction with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which I urge you all to join and participate in. They have some uh, great programs, and I've been privileged to be a part of it. I want to thank Erica Martin again for her help to me in producing this and um, any errors are mine and not hers. Since there is again no one here to introduce me, let me say that my name is John Worley. I uh, live in Beaufort. I'm a retired lawyer having attended the Citadel undergraduate and the University of Virginia Law School and retired from the law around 2011 and have been a full-time writer since then. I have five published novels out there, the latest of which is The Home Guard, which is historical fiction set in Beaufort during the Civil War, a coming-of-age love story uh, that takes place in the middle of the war. It's available on my website if you're interested, www.johnworley.com. And uh, if any questions arise during the lecture, uh, you can email me at johnworley at gmail.com. Several of you have, and I've been happy to respond to those emails. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Beaufort at the end of the war, uh, as some of you know, because of the traffic that has uh, viewed it on YouTube, uh, I did a lecture on Civil War Beaufort and then followed it up with Beaufort and Reconstruction in 1865. That, of course, was the year the war ended. Now we're going into the next year, but in order to set the stage for what happens in 1866, I need to drop back a little bit and recap the situation at the end of 1865. Of course, the war ended in April as a practical matter. The war ended with Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April of 1865. A few days after the surrender, Lincoln was assassinated, which made his vice president, Andrew Johnson, president. And I'm going to talk in this lecture quite a bit about Andrew Johnson because it is essential to what happened in Beaufort during Reconstruction to understand what was going on at the national level one thing that legislature did that was, in hindsight, quite ill-advised was they adopted what were called black codes. I'm going to go through a couple of the provisions of those. Uh, for example, uh, now bear in mind the 13th Amendment had been enacted and was effective. That outlawed slavery. But just because a southern plantation owner couldn't own a slave after that uh, amendment did not mean that he could not treat his black workers as slaves, tantamount to slavery. So uh, a slave, for example, a black was barred from any occupation other than a farmer or a servant without payment of an annual tax, and that tax could be prohibitive, um, they had to sign an annual labor contract as a servant. Uh, the working hours were sun up to sundown. They had to have permission to leave the plantation or to have guests at, visit them on the plantation. And if they didn't have a work contract, they were unemployed, they were subject to 
vagrancy laws, uh, no visible means of support, and they could be arrested. So it, you could forgive the African Americans for asking, what is really different about my status now that I'm no longer a slave? What's really different from what these black codes uh, uh, institute? Well, not much, actually. In South Carolina, as opposed to some of the other southern states, the black codes actually didn't stay in effect very long. Uh, General Sickles uh, immediately canceled them about 10 days after they were adopted. So it's not necessarily the um, it's not necessarily the legal impact that they have as much as it says about how that Southern legislature was thinking, having lost the war. Uh, and they were warned. Uh, some friends in the North and in the Congress said, look, if you adopt these codes, you're just asking for trouble. I mean, the North is sort of put out with you as it is. They've lost hundreds of thousands of citizens to the Civil War. Of course, the South had too, but the South had instituted it. The North had lots of people dead, and they were not in a very good mood. And to pass these black codes was like tweaking their beak. And they were warned not to do it, but they uh, unfortunately didn't pay any attention to that. And we'll see what happens as we get into the year 1866. So, as I say, I need to talk about Andrew Johnson because he had a unique opportunity in U.S. history as a president to shape not only history, the history he was living through, but his legacy as a president. And we'll see how he did that. The Congress, it was a very unusual situation. The Congress was uh, elected in March of 1865, but it did not meet until December of that year. So if you think about the events that happened between the election of the Congress and them actually taking their seats in Washington, uh, the war ended, Lincoln was assassinated, Johnson became president, all of that while Congress was not in session. So this period is known as presidential reconstruction for a very good reason. Johnson had essentially a carte blanche to handle reconstruction as he saw fit. And originally there was a lot of optimism uh, that Johnson would handle it well. He uh, was basically a devotee of Lincoln's uh, malice toward none policy. And so a lot of the more moderate Republicans in Congress thought that he would be all right, that he would uh, protect the uh, gains that had been made by the war and uh, deal with people fairly. And that was the goodwill that Johnson started out uh, in, with the mourning, as you can imagine, over Lincoln's assassination in the North. Uh, the mourning, uh, they welcomed Johnson as perhaps someone they could work with. The political situation is something to keep in mind throughout this discussion. The 39th Congress, with, which is what we're dealing with, had large Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate. There was a group of radical Republicans in both houses of Congress, but they were at this point a fairly small minority. Uh, Charles Sumner uh, in the Senate was one of the leaders. Um, Thaddeus Stevens in the House was a leader of the radical Republicans. And they were radical because they wanted universal male suffrage, which of course would have included African Americans having the vote. And the Congress was not ready for that yet. Uh, so uh, they also uh, espoused free labor, although there was some inconsistency with the radicals about how they wanted to handle the labor situation. But they were all pretty much 
unified on the issue of universal mail and note uh, note I note mail underline mail because this uh, a lot of the abolitionists would end up taking a lot of heat from females who did not understand that if they favored universal suffrage, why that didn't uh, apply to females as well. But that's a discussion for another day. So we have to talk about Andrew Johnson. Here he is. Um, that's him on the right. Uh, and I want to give you a little bit of his background and we can talk about sort of where things went off the rails with him. Uh, his personal history, born in North Carolina, uh, he was a very ambitious man, uh, moved to Greenville, Tennessee as a young man, became mayor as a young man. What's that? He was 26 years old when he became mayor of the town he had moved to. Uh, seven years later, elected to the Tennessee Senate, then sent to Congress in 1843 governor of Tennessee in 1853. He was a Democrat. And remember I said a minute ago that the Repo the Congress was heavily Republican uh, when he became president, but he was a Democrat. He'd been elected to the U.S. Senate in 1857, and he was the only Southern Senator to remain in the Senate after his state seceded from the Union. This, of course, scored high points with Lincoln and the people around Lincoln. So when Lincoln put together a unity ticket uh, for re-election in 1864, he, put, he substituted out uh, his vice president who had served him in his first term, and he put Andrew Johnson on his ticket, a national unity ticket that won Lincoln re-election in 1864. Uh, one of his more infamous personal uh, points was his drunkenness at his own inauguration, Johnson's that is, on March the 4th of 1864, causing, uh, he he'd had uh, many drinks the night before. When he got to the ceremony, he told one of his buddies that he needed a little bracer, a little something to uh, the hair of the dog. And so he took a few drinks and uh, made a rambling speech at his inauguration, embarrassed Lincoln tremendously. But Lincoln being Lincoln, Lincoln came to his defense afterwards and said, eh, you know, he's not a drunk. He had a bad day, but he's not a drunk. So forgive him, go light on him. So Th those were that was some of Johnson's personal history and and now he's president. What were his priorities as president? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that his big priority was winning the presidency in his own right in 1868. He was thinking ahead. He was going to run as a democrat. He thought between conservative republicans in the house Demo white Democrats in the South and throughout the country, uh, he thought he could put together a coalition that would prevail in the Electoral College and elect him as president. So to do that, he had to stay on good terms with white Southern Democrats, uh, many of whom had su uh, supported secession and fought with the Confederacy. He, he didn't want to make the readmission of the seceding states too painful because that would cost him white Southern support. And he also thought he could, uh, by sort of adopting a middle of the road reconstruction policy, he thought he could maintain favor with moderate Republicans in the, uh, in the Congress while uh, throwing a bone, occasional bone to the radicals and appeasing them as best he could. So he was walking sort of a political tightrope, but that's that was his philosophy for handling it. And it might have worked. It, he had an excellent opportunity to make it work, except for a few problems. And that was his personality. 
Uh, there's a reason Johnson is rated one of the worst presidents in the history of the United States. And I'm relying here on Eric Foner's uh, wonderful book on Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution to talk about some of Johnson's personal attributes. First of all, nobody disputed the fact that he was a terrific public orator. The man could speak to a crowd. But counterbalancing that was self-absorption, uh, narcissism, if you will, to borrow a more current term, uh, a lonely man. He had few friends, confided in no one. And if you're the president, as Lincoln had shown and others had shown before him, uh, conf uh, getting the advice of others uh, can be a real asset. Uh, it's hard to occupy that office and think you know all the answers. But Johnson was apparently one of those who had total confidence in his own opinion, thought he knew all the answers, and uh, made some major mistakes without, uh, as a result of that. Made major decisions without consulting anyone, uh, just whatever his gut told him. Stubborn. Once he made up his mind, he was very hard to, uh, it was very hard for him to change his mind. Intolerant of the views of others. Imagine being in that position and having people around you who are trying to keep you from running off the rails and you just don't listen to them. Uh, so hand in hand with that went the lack of ability to compromise. So you can see where these personal characteristics do not bode well for his presidency and it did not bode well for the country either. As I say, he had this eight or nine month period between April of 1865, when he was elevated to the presidency, and the time that Congress came in and, and, and organized itself in December of 1865. He had about eight months where he could do pretty much whatever he wanted to do by way of reconstruction and, and presidential edict. And so this era, this eight or nine months is what is known as presidential reconstruction and presidential reconstruction if things had turned out differently might have lasted for all of Johnson's tenure as president uh, could have even led to his re-election as president or his election I should say since he was never elected the first time his re-election as president in 1868 had he been other than he was. So shortly after Congress uh, came into session in December of 1865, Johnson made some fatally bad decisions which essentially cost him all of the goodwill or most of the goodwill that he had when he took over from Lincoln. The first thing he did, which stunned uh, the Congress, was to veto the extension of the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, I talked about the Freedmen's Bureau in the last lecture, but I want to talk about it a little bit more now to, to give you the significance of that veto. The Freedmen's Bureau was essentially a large bureaucracy set up to administer to the African Americans in the wake of uh, their freedom and the end of the Civil War. Uh, until the Freedmen's Bureau was established, it was the military's job. And I listed some uh, things that needed to be done. Uh, for example, uh, the blacks wanted to own the land they had worked for generations. They wanted education. They wanted freedom from fear. They were Many were afraid that their old masters would be back and that they would pay the price for that. Uh, they wanted ultimately the vote. They wanted a say in the government that, they, that uh, they lived under. Well, certainly as, as far as their personal safety went and as far as education went, it, it fell to the military immediately after the end of the war, and the military just was not equipped to do it. I remember I talked about all the freedmen that were 
following uh, Sherman in his march through South Carolina, putting a terrible burden on his logistical uh, train. And uh, that, that prompted Sherman's famous uh, uh, field order number 15, where he tried to give the freedmen land so they would stay in place, stay on the sea islands and not follow his soldiers and uh, need food and shelter and all the rest of it. So the, when it was originally passed, the Freedmen's Bureau, and I, to, to borrow a modern analogy, I would, I would suggest to you that now we have, of course, all sorts of federal agencies. We have Health and Human Services, we have the Department of Education, we have the Department of Labor. All of these things have been federalized but back in the 1860s, they didn't have any of those things. You know, Lincoln had a Secretary of War and a Secretary of the Treasury and a Secretary of State. He didn't have the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. He didn't have all of these bureaucracies that we had now. So the Freedmen's Bureau was really one of the first of those kind of almost modern style bureaucracies where the, where the Congress was essentially saying, look, you guys go deal with this. We've got a lot of got a lot of issues, a lot of administrative stuff to deal. Go deal with it. So when it was originally passed, the Freedmen's Bureau was uh, had a limited lifespan. So this was the vote to reauthorize the Freedmen's Bureau, which, although it had some issues, uh, was essentially viewed as essential <clears throat> and had wide support in Congress almost unanimous Republican support, they extended its life. Johnson vetoed it. The Republicans in Congress were incredulous. Why would he do such a thing? Well, he said that it was because he uh, did not think that he, the Constitution authorized him to uh, establish a bureaucracy like that, or the Congress to establish it, that it was uh, up to the states to do it. You, you're going to hear some echoes of some modern arguments being made here. I don't want to get into modern politics, but some of the same uh, views are being put forward today. Uh, the debate about what the what is legitimate role for the states and what is a legitimate role for the federal government. Well, this was going on uh, during Johnson's administration, and that, that's the position he took. Uh, but there was a healthy measure of politics in it. Now, remember, when I say the Republicans in Congress had passed this, South Carolina did not have any representatives in Congress at the time. Neither did Georgia. Neither did Alabama. The southern states were not represented because in December of 65, when the Congress was organized, they looked at the composition of the, of the Southern contingencies, the people that the South sent to be congressmen and senators, and they said, now, we know these guys. We've seen this movie. These are the same guys that started the war and fought in the war. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens, the radical uh, leader in the, in the House, radical Republican leader in the House, called him those uh, congressional delegations from the South, aggravation, aggregations of whitewashed rebels. And so the House refused to seat them. So none of the Southerners had a voice in what was going on in Congress early in 1866, and in fact, for all of 1866. So the first stunner was that he vetoed the extension of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, it went to an override vote and fell two votes short. It was later that override, uh, that veto was overridden in a subsequent action and the Freedmen's Bureau was extended. But right now we're talking about early in Johnson's relationship with the new Congress. Then along came the Civil Rights Bill of 1866 which gave Af African Americans uh, the, the rights enjoyed by whites. Um, let's back up and review. The, as I said, now because of the 13th Amendment, it's illegal to have slaves. So the slaves are no longer 
uh, slaves legally. But as we saw from the Black Codes, that didn't give them any rights as citizens. They could be treated just as badly as they had been treated up until then, um, as shown by the Black Codes. So in order to protect uh, African Americans and to preserve what the North thought were the gains that they had gained by winning the Civil War, they uh, enacted a civil rights uh, bill. Now, that also passed the 1866 Congress by an overwhelming majority uh, in both houses. And again, Johnson vetoed it. Again, utter disbelief on Capitol Hill that he would do this. He was obviously currying favor with white Democrats, conservative Democrats, and Republicans in the Congress, and had his eyes set on 1868. Again, walking the fine line, but as far as the Congress was concerned, he was way over the line. He wasn't walking the middle of the road. He'd gone over to, uh, in effect, the dark side uh, of, uh, of Reconstruction. So the Congress did something uh, with the Civil Rights Bill that in effect had never been done in Congress before. They overrode the presidential veto, the first time in the history of the country that a veto had been overridden on a major piece of legislation. There had been some vetoes issued by previous presidents and some of those had been overridden, but they were mostly on things like appointments and, and more or less housekeeping things. First real substantive veto in the history of the country. And the Congress said, nah, no, we're gonna, we, we need this, we're gonna enact it. And so uh, they overrode Johnson's veto. That should give you an idea of uh, the rift that was developing between Johnson and the Congress. Uh, Eric Foner, who again is considered uh, probably the leading expert on Reconstruction has called it the most disastrous miscalculation of Johnson's political career. And he will ultimately pay uh, a price for that, as we will see. Um, so there was a push after the Civil Rights Bill, even after it was enacted, uh, to embody in the Constitution protections for African Americans, and that uh, gave birth to the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, of course, is perhaps the most litigated amendment of the whole Constitution even today. It provided for equal protection of the laws and um, due process of law, and it was a way to um, enshrine in the Constitution a lot of the protections that were in the Civil Rights Bill, but a Civil Rights Bill could have been changed by the next Congress, it could have been repealed. The thought was that the 14th Amendment, if, if they could get that through, that would enshrine these protections forever, just like the Bill of Rights and uh, other amendments to the Constitution. So this was an important push to get the 14th Amendment through. It also, it made blacks citizens of the United States uh, because they were born in the United States. They were citizens of the United States to find citizenship for the first time because remember the Dred Scott decision, uh, in effect overruled the Dred Scott decision which said that blacks were not citizens of the United States. That, why, that was why Dred Scott Scott could get no relief in the U.S. Supreme Court. But the 14th Amendment made them citizens and gave them equal protection of the law. And so, as it turns out, the South, the seceding states were going to be required, the 14th Amendment passed through Congress. Then it went out to the states for ratification in accordance with the principle of the requirements of the constitutions that states ratify amendments to it. 
it went out for ratification and to get back into the union the south is going to have to ratify the 14th amendment as part of their uh, their redemption as states we'll talk about redemption in another lecture but so did the uh, did the South ratify the 14th Amendment? How was it greeted in South Carolina and other uh, southern states, other seceding states, when it came back to them for ratification? Now we're in the summer and fall of 1866. And uh, as I say, ratification ratification was required for a southern state to get back into the union so what did south carolina do remember that congress that passed the the state general assembly that passed the black codes well those guys were still sitting around in columbia they were not too wild about the 14th amendment um both house and senate rejected it the south carolina house rejected it by a vote of 95 to 1, which gives you some idea of what the attitude of that legislature was toward any of these uh, rehabilitation measures being passed in the North. They just weren't having it. So it was a recipe for disaster, and it wasn't going to be too long before disaster hit. Um, I showed this uh, slide before, but I want to just review it. Uh, what were the Sea Islanders? Now we're talking about Beaufort and the Sea Islands here. Hilton Head, Bluffton, um, uh, Fripp, what is now Fripp, wasn't then, Ladies Island. What did they want? The, well, the African Americans certainly wanted... Um, to land, as I say, the land that they had been working for generations. They wanted to vote, the voice in their government. They wanted education, and they wanted freedom from fear. What did they get? Well, they did get land. Um, by uh, I mentioned all those tax sales. Those tax sales continued through 1865, 1866. Uh, a lot of African Americans were able to purchase land as a result of those tax sales. Whereas the number of landowners in Beaufort and the Sea Islands had been a couple of hundred before the, sea, before the Civil War, a few landowners owning huge tracts of acreage. After the Civil War, it was divided into small farms, many of them owned by African Americans. And you can see this statistic um, by uh, 2,000 freedmen owned land in Beaufort on the Sea Islands um, after the Civil War, which had been unheard of for them to own any prior to the Civil War, but certainly not in, at that level after the Civil War. What did the whites do? Well, uh, some of the, as I mentioned, some of the white families started drifting back to Beaufort those who had participated in the great skedaddle. And they wanted their family property back. They said, we've been gone. We couldn't pay the taxes. You have, uh, you have conscripted our land illegally, and we want it back. So they started filing lawsuits. Uh, a total of 22 white families had brought a total of 44 lawsuits by 1873. This litigation went on for years. And very interestingly, and I may have covered this in a previous lecture, but um, I, I think it's worth covering again that one of those tax sales involved the house that Robert Smalls acquired in a tax sale and lived in for the rest of his life. The house had originally, which is on Prince Street, and you can see it today, I had a slide of it in the last uh, presentation, uh, but the house on Prince Street was originally owned by the McKee family, the, the owners of Robert Smalls when he was a slave. The McKees sold it to the Detreville family. 
The Detrevilles fail to pay the taxes, so at an auction, uh, Robert Smalls bought the house for something like $600. Well, the Detrevilles came back to Beaufort after the war, and they wanted the property back. Robert Smalls said no. It went to litigation, and the case ultimately ended up before the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Smalls v. Detrevilles. And the U.S. Supreme Court decided in favor of Robert Smalls, the leading Supreme Court case on tax sales in Beaufort during the war. And Robert Smalls was able to live in that house for the rest of his life. So in terms of land, the, the freedmen were successful in getting land. It's one of, the, one of their priorities. Education. This was another success story. Probably the greatest success story of the Freedmen's Bureau was the establishment of education. Uh, 1866, the year we're dealing with, one year after the war ended, there were 54 schools for freedmen in Beaufort and the Sea Islands. And remember, before the Civil War, there were zero. So 54 uh, schools employing 130 teachers, with over 7,000 students, African Americans were thirsty for education. <clears throat> but of course, uh, uh, they could not get to Penn School, established by Laura Town on, uh, on St. Helena's Island. They had trouble getting into town because they're so spread out and they have to navigate the water. So a lot of uh, what they call farm schools were set up. These were schools on the property uh, white instructors, black pupils, uh, and the instructors paid for <clears throat> by uh, renting out the property to uh, uh, sharecroppers and truck farmers and people that would pay for the privilege of uh, renting the property and raising crops. And, a lot, and these uh, schools were much modeled on the Port Royal experiment that had been begun when the Union missionaries arrived from the North in 1862, principal among them, Laura Town and her, and her uh, co-teachers. Uh, freedom from fear, and this is starting to get a little problematic. Naturally, once the war was over, the blacks uh, wondered what would happen to them, to their security. They anticipated white Bufortonians returning, some of their masters coming back, both of which happened, and they were concerned that those masters would be in a very bad mood and might take it out on the freedmen through violence. Compounding their apprehension was the fact that uh, the Union troops that had occupied Beaufort for the war were now being reassigned to Charleston. So there were fewer and fewer federal troops left in Beaufort to enforce what law there was and to protect the freedmen. Uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the troops that were left happened to be African-American troops. So as long as African-Americans were uh, armed African-American troops were in Beaufort protecting African-Americans on the Sea Islands, it, the situation was very manageable and there were not that many instances of violence. But the blacks were arming themselves in anticipation that there were going to be problems. So with the blacks arming themselves, the whites bring, that returned bringing back their weapons both sides were armed, and so you had the potential for a real race war. It never developed as that. There was violence. There was some black-on-white violence, some white-on-black violence. But in general, on the Sea Islands, uh, the situation was, was kept under control. The situation became very different very quickly on the mainland. Uh, remember, the mainland is only 20, 25 miles from Beaufort. When the whites came back to places like Yemassee and up the Cumbie River to those plantations, there were very few federal troops at all. There were quite a few African Americans. 
So the stage was set for some problems uh, that we will explore more in the next session. Uh, lastly, the African Americans wanted the right to vote, to have a say in the governments that control their destiny. Uh, they didn't get it in 1865, certainly. They didn't get it in 1866. It's a battle for another day, and it will be quite a contentious battle, as we will see in the next lecture. I hope you will join us for uh, Reconstruction 1867, which I hope to have up in a week or 10 days. And I hope you are enjoying the format of taking this uh, Reconstruction, which is such a huge, complicated issue that stretched, as I said in the first lecture, from, by most accounts, 1865 to 1877. So you're, we'd have to cover 12 years. It's just not possible to cover those 12 years in one or two sessions. So I've decided that a more manageable way to do this would be to do it year by year. So uh, we covered a lot of 1866 today. Not all of it. It's impossible in 30, 40, 50 minutes to cover it. But I hope I've given you a flavor for what went on in 1866. And the next lecture will be 1867, and I hope you will uh, join me for that. And if you, uh, when you view the video on YouTube of 1866, please leave a comment uh, if you enjoy this format, or email me directly, or you can also email uh, Buford, uh, the Buford, uh, USC Buford, and the OLLI program, and let them know uh, what your reaction is. Anyway, I've enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. I always do. And I'll see you next time.